covered lots of stuff, yeah? Okay. Uh, that's for some of you got to learn the next card today. Go somewhere out to the next room. I'm not sure to what extent you're up to that card. You can practice most of the best of all the time. And, and, and grab you. Yeah. So, um, you guys can come away saying hopefully you're uh, 10 more steps ahead on your next card, which is good. Uh, for the rest of us, it was kind of like a, I suppose, a combination on the weekend of, as I said, your own training. And uh, also teaching tips or a guidance to help make you a complete instructor. Okay? So you can cater for your students. But it's really a lot of it's about communicating with students and how well you can communicate what you're doing, how you can make it interesting and fun, how you can blend the occasion with a bit of humour, a bit of appropriate. Uh, but certainly how you can paint a picture into people's minds of what they're doing. You don't have to go into huge long monologues every five minutes to tell me doing your technique. Uh, but it's there in the knowledge bank, it's all out as you go. You make it more perspective. For the younger students, of course, uh, there's no use being a sort of stubbornly old school and refusing to make your class, that's primarily, perhaps primarily children, refusing to make it fun because the is not supposed to be fun, it's supposed to be serious and hard. You, know, you can't take it out of jail, otherwise you're going to have a very empty cocoa in a few weeks. But <laughs> it's true, you'll have the odd young child who just doesn't want to do anything else except karate, who just wants to train karate for a months a week, total maniac, right? He doesn't do any other sports, nothing, just trains in karate. You can throw anything at them, and they'll be back every week saying, give me more, give me more, yeah? Okay. But we can't judge, we can't judge our overall students. <coughs> Based on that, probably four or five percent of young kamikaze kids, right? Okay. And even then, the kamikaze kids will still come back, they'll still enjoy it. And if they really want to go to another level, they'll go to an hour and a half class full of adults. It's not like there's no avenue for that. There is an avenue for that. We have primarily children, I know a lot of you are fairly new to the Sensei program. Uh, most likely you're going to be uh, stationed in a dojo with an existing instructor if you haven't already done it. And you'll be helping out with junior students, and junior just doesn't necessarily mean junior A, but mean junior grade as well. And uh, so your ability to communicate and understand the curriculum and how the system works will just make you better at communicating that. Yeah? Okay. Uh, as you can appreciate, I feel like I get to travel around a fair bit and train with a lot of Senseis. UK, Australia, and here, and some of our best senseis aren't necessarily our highest grade karate. Yeah? That's not to say that high grades can't be good senseis, it's just saying it's no guarantee that they'll be a great instructor. Okay? You may be someone who started karate late in life, you may have some flexibility issues, you know, you may have difficulty getting down, some of your red belt kids might have better stances than you. Okay? In reality, that could be the case, but I don't want you to let that discourage you. As long as you know what a good gold standard should look like, your responsibility in that role is to help them improve. Okay. Along the way, it's going to hold you to a higher standard. It's going to you to keep getting better. Okay. Along with your training and senior class, obviously, which is <coughs> there to enhance that also. But uh, at the end of the day, people don't really care how much you know. Right? If I come into a class full of yellow belts right now, they don't really care how long I've been with GKR. They don't really care what my grade is. They might sort of go, ooh, ah, for a minute, and then it's back to reality. All they care about is how much I care about them. <laughs> they care about is how much attention I'm paying to them and how I can help them. That's all, dare I say, anybody really cares about. We're all sort of inherently self-centered, you might say. Not, I don't mean that in a negative way, but generally speaking, your instructor knows you're less interested in how good he is and more interested in how good he thinks you are or how good he can make you. Does that make sense? Okay. So this is, uh, I suppose when we go into the day those teachers, we go in with that giving attitude, right? For that hour, that hour and a half, you get yourself up into a peak state, irrespective of what state you've had. When you get in that class, try to embody the true spirit of what it means to walk into a dojo. When you bow in, just make that sort of, yep, routine, in you go. As the sensor, you have to be the thermostat in the room. You set the temperature. You, know? you have to react to the temperature. That's your student's job. They react to you. And if you go to the dojo, I know sometimes you might have had a rough day, you might be feeling that great, you might have had a horrid day at work or something. When you walk in and you bow in, treat the symbology of that bowing for what it is. Right? You bow in, you walk in, you leave everything behind you. You walk into the dojo, you're a focused person, you're focused on your people. And one of the quickest ways to cheer yourself up is to go and cheer someone else up. Okay. Okay. A lot of the time when people are in a uh, downer or flat, they do the opposite. They're hoping someone will come along and cheer them up. Sometimes they didn't expect it. The quickest way to cheer yourself up is to go and cheer someone else up. The quickest way to get yourself in a better mood is to pay someone a compliment. Right? Not a false one, hopefully. Find, find a reason 
you give a genuine compliment to people. It's not that hard. Yeah. So, um, the stuff we did last night, the self-defense stuff, you're not going to be spending whole classes doing that, unless you have like a special seminar that you might do every now and then, it might be self-defense related, but generally speaking, that stuff's there kind of to fill the gap between the basics and the sparring, or between, between the basics um, and a uh, real life, I might say, self-defense situation. So, you've got your sparring, which is all moving in and out, we're not grabbing into the much of sparring, are we? We're moving in and out, throwing techniques, it's all about stuff being thrown at you. What we did last night is a different scenario where someone's actually beginning the altercation with seizing hold of you somewhere. Throat, wrists, shirt, hair, whatever. Okay? Um, and of course we could have done a lot more last night. We could have gone to midnight. It was heaps of stuff that we still done. But as it was, we went late. So that stuff's just set to sort of bridge the gap between everything you're learning basics and the very limited amount of basics you can do in style. Yeah? Because you really only do we're really doing straight punching, sparring, maybe back fists, the old high toe for a great over two. You're doing your front kicks, maybe some round kicks, not doing many side kicks. You might do the odd back kick, but you're not really doing them in any great um, volume. It's really just a 90% of what you do is about four techniques, four or five techniques, isn't it? Yeah. And all the stuff you do using your elbows and your shoe toes and elbows in for blocking and things like that, they're not as relevant when someone's fighting you. Yes, you need to keep your elbows in your guard. It's not as relevant as when someone sees hold of you and you have to be able to wriggle your way out without relying on being the stronger person. Because in reality, I guess, if someone wants to grab hold of you, it's likely that they'll pick on someone smaller than them, smith than them, you're probably going to have a size issue, most likely. Yeah? Um, ladies especially, an altercation is rarely likely to start with a man trying to punch you. Yeah? If a, if a, in, in a tax, generally speaking, a man will come up and usually grab a woman by the hair or wherever, right? It's not usually in front of the woman, duck a few times and book, <laughs> and then grab hold. They might, if you happen to get down on the ground, there might be some of that going on, heaven forbid. But generally speaking, a stand up position usually begins with moving into your space and grabbing hold. So, what we learned last night is a great start point for a lot of people in that scenario, especially the ladies. It's not to say that a man can get in the same situation. This aggressive behaviour from one man to another usually begins, or more than half the time, begins with some sort of strike or a hit of some description. You could be grabbed up, who knows? So, what we did last night enabled us to open up the uh, catalogue of techniques a bit more that we use in basics that we don't use in sparring. Hey. Does that make sense? Hey. Right. Hey. So, not in stage one. Remember, stage one was really just release. Hands <coughs> off. And that's mostly applicable to uh, young children in the school environment, or it could be you in, as I said, Christmas party, front brother-in-law, whatever the situation may be, okay? Uh, but then stage two starts to open up the catalogue of other techniques. Of uh, keeping the elbows in, of uh, being mindful, keeping in tidy and tight, and being able to defend yourself at close quarters. Not having the ability to move in and bounce around at range and, and moving like a sparring does. So it does fill a gap there, in my opinion, yeah? Because okay. uh, being seized and hit is more likely to happen in real life than someone sparring you and doing a few jabs and then hitting, yeah? <coughs> More likely, and in actual fact, it uses more about blocks and more about techniques than just sparring does. So sparring definitely has its has its value. Don't get me wrong; it has its value. Range, reflexes, dealing with spontaneous stuff, um, the intimidation factor of someone coming and attacking you, and you learning to react. Hopefully, in better and better ways. Right? It keeps you covered up. Who was able to use a little bit of their old routine in training today? Who was practicing that? Hope you were. Um, you don't want to practice that stuff in basics and you just get inspiring and do the stuff you're already doing. As I said, in the early grades especially, you want to be sparring at thinking speed. And the sense is you want your early grades to be doing that. And you want your early grades to be focusing on the type of combinations we did right at the start of class yesterday. Good, straight, strong techniques. Okay? They don't need to be learning a flappy round thing before they learn how to do a strong reverse punch. Yeah? And a strong lunge punch. And a strong front kick. It doesn't mean they should never do a round kick, but it shouldn't be their focus. The focus should be on the straight, linear stuff and getting that happening, moving forward with some flow before you start putting back fists and side kicks in and things like that. Okay? Okay. If someone's coming in to attack you and you don't want to go back, if it's a, if it's a bigger person, for example, if you someone who's much taller you coming in, and they're coming with straight techniques, you don't want to be leaning back and throwing round kicks to sort of beat them off. It's not going to work. You need to be able to take back or throw or come up and Hit forward or hit straight technique. Technique where you're backwards anchored and you're not going back any further. And if you go back a little bit, just a little bit, and then back forward again to stop the momentum coming forward. So um, there's a bit of a, a bit of a thought process going around that 
uh, low-grade students must always spar with their hands closed. Let's be closed. That's not a policy, by the way. It maybe how some people have interpreted the policy. It's not policy. Yellow belts don't have to be like this the whole time. And you can imagine, crunch, 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 this way, right? They're going to get injured, and the people kicking are going to get injured. You know? Boom, elbows. This popped the elbow on the foot from a yellow belt fashion. You know? right? So, a could definitely they did strike with their hands shut. One of the reasons we want their hands closed most of the time is so they don't accidentally do this out of panic. When you're going at a slow speed, you don't have to worry about panic. They can have one hand closed, or one closed, one open, or whatever, both closed, and they can practice blocking with their hands out open if they want to. It's not like they have to spend months just crunch, 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 and after all the time we we can open the hands. You know, we can teach them this stuff. So I'm just in progression. Hey, hey, hey. This weekend we've tried to sort of work in that progression. Yesterday we did the basic exercises from distance, moved in, then we did the more complex stuff. We went from straight punches and straight kicks to straight punches, round kicks, round techniques, and our ability to. So, can you see how it's sort of crazy getting you can spar on full speed until you've done a lot of those drills? They don't even know how to react, they're just going to react the same way they did when they arrived in your class on the first night. Yeah? And if you're at that stage at the moment, you can slide down. You, know? you, you don't need to be overly competitive in your sparring in a dojo, unless it's some. Um, a range of the sensors put in place and he's doing like a little point scoring thing. You should treat Kumite as a <coughs> learning process. Right? It's like rallies, it's like tennis players having a rally. They're throwing each other around the court and they're moving in, they're attacking every now and then, but it's not done with any great ulterior motive. If someone gets a technique again, it's not a big deal. You don't have to go home and sort of stay awake at night thinking about that thing, you know? <laughs> it just doesn't, it doesn't matter. It's time to be aggressive, and you can be aggressive but not out of control. Okay, so I guess you just got to find that happy medium because you should be enjoying the sparring and your students should enjoy the sparring. Okay? Uh, what I don't like to see, and I see it a bit, is where you'll have a class full of um, different ages and sparring all happening and they'll line everybody up and everyone picks a partner about their own size and you can move to the left and all of a sudden I'm up against an eight year old. And it's all cute and men like this and stuff like that, but just don't do it. Right? Just put the kids in their own group of six and rotate them around themselves. And get the bigger people rotating around. Okay? Right. Or you don't need to put a big adult with a little kid. Right. Or a big adult male with a 12, 13 year old girl. Or boy for that matter. Yeah? It's just, it's not, what's the point? If you're doing a self defense exercise where the, the male was going to grab the girl and she's going to practice, it wasn't me and bang, well maybe. But not in a sparring scenario. It's actually, there's too much chance, especially if the bigger guy is a lower rate, there's too much chance for accidentally hit that person. In okay. panic, yeah? Not that you should be panicking, but. You've seen it happen, one of those. Uh, so just go, keep people rough with this exercise initially. Be mindful, and I wrote this in an article recently, be mindful when you're practicing self-defense, especially with new students. The first two or three classes a person does, after you've gone through the basics and some kicking and stuff, you get to the end. Rather than do maybe cars for the first class or second class, teach them a few wrist turns, a few self-defense techniques. Give them something to go home with, like something to put in their pocket. And leave learning something. Look, yeah, there's time to do the cover. Uh, I'm not saying don't start the cover projects, but the first couple of lessons, do some of those things. Let them feel, show them which UK, show them which UK working. You know, twisting out. Show them how to get out using the thumbs as the exit point and so on. Little things like that can be good for new people to learn. But be mindful, and I'm, I'm conscious of sounding sexist here, but be mindful in the early days when you're practicing self defense. You don't want um, to put a man and a woman together. So it's just, I suppose, a bit of a sensitive issue. You don't want to put a man and a woman together. New female student, new male student. Okay, self defense. <laughs> <laughs> well, self defense, you know, like this. With a, with a woman and a man here, just be mindful of people's sensitivity to that. Right. Uh, people's sense of space. Um, I'm not saying a woman may not like that, but I suspect they would <laughs> coming out of their first class. It might be a bit intimidating as it is. Don't put some big, hairy, sweaty guy all over it. Part them up. Yeah, that's right. But uh, maybe some guy, that's what I have to say in my disclaimer, some guy might not be comfortable being grabbed by a woman either. So that could be the case too. But next to say, be sensitive to that in the early going. Does that make sense? Hey, hey, hey. Don't, uh, don't think that's not going to people's minds. We actually get a, we actually get a good indication of how people feel 
we drive people up out of their homes, as you know, most of the time. Probably the majority of this room was joined up from someone coming and visiting you. Right? We've got a pretty good handle on what people's fears are when they're going to start to run. And a lot of people don't say that there's a few unspoken fears. One of the unspoken ones is I'm going to be stupid. And the other is that people are going to be fighting me, hitting me, grabbing me. I don't know if I'm comfortable with that. They're real fears that are often unspoken. So just be sensitive to that in the early go. Yeah? And, um, yeah, so hopefully that was PC enough to work. <laughs> Alright. Now, uh, lastly, I just want to announce uh, this weekend, the primary purpose of this was to be a, a sensei workshop, but I was also uh, looking at someone uh, for a grading. Now, you guys have black belt gradings a couple of times a year anyway in each of the cities, but occasionally uh, uh, when we all get together, it's uh, a chance to look at people up the higher end. And uh, today I'm pleased to announce successful grading to third down black belt. Right. Sanda, third down black belt. Andrew Cooper. <laughs>
Robert Beck in Christchurch doing a fantastic job down there. Ian Lane's been here a long time. Uh, Robert Van Etten, long time. I know it's funny, isn't it? I'm leaving the people out that have only been here 12 years. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just including that for being here for like you know, 15, 16 years virtually. So I don't think I'll leave anybody out. But it's great to see uh, so many people coming back and a lot of the uh, originals here. Setting a good example for the uh, younger sensei's. The guys that have been here for a long time, they see a lot of people come and go. They see a lot of instructors, branch instructors coming in and out of the team. And uh, over time, they've just slowly grown through time and trained to be the sort of the old statesman of their region. I don't mean necessarily old people, but <laughs> experience. Thank you. 